it's a great pleasure, I think, to, to kick off this meeting. Uh, we have some new unpublished data that we are very excited about. So uh, I hope that you uh, guys will enjoy the presentation. Uh, my name is Andre Sakai. I am a last year PhD student uh, in the group of Professor Willem Huck at the Radboud University in the Netherlands. And today I want to share a bit of our efforts on building a, a self-free expression system uh, using uh, JCVI SYNC3A cells. And for those who are not very familiar with uh, self-free expression systems or CFE, they will call here, uh, those are in vitro uh, platforms that allows us to reconstitute transcription and translation reactions. So basically we can produce proteins outside the boundaries of a living cell. And that also enables us uh, much more flexibility in customizing uh, the protein production. Uh, CFE systems were, uh, are currently used for several different applications, such as uh, basic uh, cellular or uh, uh, cellular biology studies like elucidation of metabolic pathways or structural biology studies or for the production and screening of biodrugs, uh, production of biosensors as well, and uh, for building a synthetic cell, which is the purpose of our subgroup here in the Netherlands. Uh, basically, the self-free expression system is composed of three main components. The first component is uh, the feeding buffer, which comprises the water, amino acids, energy sources, salts, and other cofactors. The DNA template, which codes for the protein of interest, and also a source of proteins or translational factors that are necessary for transcription and translation. And in this case, it can be uh, a cell lysate or a pure system, which is a system uh, that comprises all the individually purified proteins necessary for uh, transcription and translation. Uh, early this year, we published uh, a paper in Synthetic Biology Oxford, and we just reported our first trials in uh, creating this mycoplasma lysate or mycoplasma-based CFE system. And our first attempt, uh, we used uh, traditional methods for lysing the cell, for example, uh, French press or sonication. And those traditional lysis methods uh, did not uh, produce a lysate that supported expression. So here you can see uh, that we prepared uh, several uh, cell preparations. So the wild type, uh, mycoplasma capricolum, and the JCVI SYN3A. We tried to, for example, uh, trypsinize the cells because uh, we found a very high nuclease activity at the surface of uh, mycoplasma cells. So we tried to remove these uh, surface nucleases by uh, trypsin treatment. And we also tried, for example, to lyse the cells using chemical methods, for example, using digitoning to, uh, to, make, uh, to open pores at the membrane of mycoplasma and then uh, isolate the cytoplasmic fraction. But all those attempts in the end led us to a system that was not capable of producing proteins. And here I show uh, some of our characterizations. So we found a high uh, ribonuclease activity in, in mycoplasma lysates. So in the left-hand side, you can see an experiment in which we added uh, mycoplasma lysate into a E. coli uh, CFE uh, reaction. So uh, you, you can see that uh, this is a GFP expression. And as we increase, uh, the fraction of mycoplasma lysate into the system, uh, GFP expression is just depleted. So it means that there's something uh, in mycoplasma lysate that was just poisoning uh, the E. coli expression of GFP. And on the right-hand side, you can see the degradation of mRNA uh, when it's incubated with mycoplasma lysate. So you can see uh, for mycoplasma capricolum, MCAP, uh, SYN3A, also for trypsinized uh, SYN3A uh, cell lysate, and also for the digitoning uh, SYN3A. 
In, in this case, for digitonin syn 3 a we observed a higher content of uh, ribosomal RNAs and a lower degradation of mRNA. So that was our best lysate preparation at that time, uh, in which we observed the lowest uh, RNAs activity uh, among all the uh, lysate preparations. So after that, we were interested in uh, studying what happens uh, with these uh, lysates prepared by digitonin a little bit further. So what we did is we isolated uh, ribosomes, only the ribosomes from uh, this digitonin derived uh, SYN3A lysate. And we wanted to measure uh, the activity if these ribosomes are capable of producing proteins. And the way that we tested that uh, we added these SYN3A ribosomes into a pure system reaction we just replaced uh, the original ribosomes from pure system to uh, C3A ribosomes. And that's the graph that you can see here, the production of GFP uh, for different concentrations of uh, pure ribosomes at three and 1.5 uh, micromolar. And for C3A, we can see that there is a expression of GFP. So the ribosomes are active, even though uh, the activity is way lower compared uh, to the original ribosome from pure. Uh, so with this experiment, we saw that uh, there are ribosomes active in, in the lysates that we prepared before, and that uh, the digitoning uh, cell lysis uh, helped to maintain uh, probably the activity of these ribosomes. So mainly, probably the main problem of making functional lysates of mycoplasma is how we can separate uh, the membrane fractions from the cytosolic fraction uh, in a way that there is no contamination of the cytosolic fraction uh, caused by this uh, RNases from the membrane. So uh, uh, recently we were testing also other uh, lysis methods for, so for example, this is a uh, method called nitrogen decompression. I don't know if you're very familiar with that. It's a method usually used to lyse uh, eukaryotic cells, not cells that have cell wall, for example, E. coli or bacilli. Uh, that doesn't work very well. So it needs to be uh, a just a lipid membrane with proteins, just like uh, the membrane of mycoplasmas. So in this technique, we just uh, incubate the cell suspension into this nitrogen bomb. Uh, we increase the pressure of the nitrogen into really high pressures, uh, for example, until uh, 3000 PSI. And this allows uh, the nitrogen to be dissolved inside the cells. And a rapid uh, release of the pressure makes all the cells to burst. And then uh, we just spin down all this, uh, this the cell lysate, and then we can uh, isolate only the cyto cytoplasmic or cytosolic fraction here. Uh, the interesting uh, observation about this type of uh, lysis method is that we got a very uh, unusual layer on top of the supernatant, which is very fatty, uh, which I believe to be a, a the membrane fraction of uh, of the cells. So we never saw this before. So I think in this technique, we don't know exactly why, but we think that it allows a better separation of the membrane and also the cytosolic fraction. So here is just a table in which I put different conditions that we tested different uh, pressures and also different time for the incubation. And for this uh, third batch, we got some expression of protein. So uh, this uh, condition of lysis allowed us to, to produce a lysate that supported transcription and translation. Uh, so those are uh, the very first uh, graphs that we got about protein expression from C3A lysates. And we tested in two different conditions. The first condition we used exogenous uh, RNA polymerases, in this case, T7 RNA polymerase. And our reporter gene here in this case is uh, neon green. So we can uh, track the fluorescence over time. And uh, we can see uh, expression of neon green over time. 
here I just tested uh, different uh, conditions uh, of concentration of protein, uh, but in both cases we can see expression uh, of, uh, of neon green. We also tested uh, expression controlled by endogenous pro uh, polymerases already present in the lysate. So in this case, we don't add any exogenous polymerase. We just rely on uh, polymerases that are already in the lysate. And we do see also some expression uh, coming on. So for different uh, lysate concentrations, uh, the expression is quite lower compared to the exogenous polymerases, but uh, this is something that we are also trying to characterize a little bit further. Uh, we also did some initial optimization of the, uh, the conditions of the reaction. So the first thing that we wanted to know is if uh, the expression of proteins they relies on the addition of external tRNAs or uh, the reaction is using uh, tRNAs that are already in the lysate. So here we tested uh, a range of different concentrations for E. coli tRNAs in the reaction mix and also for yeast uh, tRNA. And it seems that there's no much difference uh, even in the absence of these external tRNAs, which means that probably uh, the expression of proteins are is relying on the endogenous tRNAs. And also uh, we, we try to check uh, what are the best energy sources for our reaction. Uh, so for example, 3PGA or PEP or some other sugars across maltose, uh, glucose, glucose 6-phosphate. So what we can see here is that probably 3PGA and PEP or even a combination of both, uh, they are the most suitable energy source, sources for the SYN3A CFE system. So uh, my conclusions for that is that uh, we can uh, finally derive SYN3A cells, uh, SYN3A lysates that support expression. One important thing here is that uh, these SYN3A CFE reactions, they relied on the addition of uh, ribosomes on top of the, the reaction. So, so we have to add more ribosomes into the reaction mix. So uh, it, it seems that the concentration of the ribosomes in the lysate is too low. So we have to add extra ones. Um, it's good to know also that uh, the reaction mix uh, relies on the endogenous tRNAs and uh, 3PJ and PEP are the most suitable energy sources. For the perspectives, we are uh, thinking of uh, optimizing these CFE conditions using a computational uh, tools like machine learning. And we are also working on building a promoter RBS library. So we can have more options to, to make any, any uh, cascade or to, to build new uh, DNA templates for testing uh, the metabolism of mycoplasma. And we are finally also uh, isolating genomic DNA from the SYN3A and trying to express that into a SYN3A CFE system as, as a model for, for building a, a protocell. So, so that's it for today. I, I'd like to thank our, our collaborators in, 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 this, uh, in this project and also BASIC, which is uh, our, our funding uh, source. And I will be happy to take any questions. Andre. I am so happy what you've shown me. So for, for those of you who don't know, this is for three years, we have been trying to develop a CFE system based on based on the minimal cell or mycoplasma mycoides. And so now finally, you know, after we published that we didn't know how, you, you have achieved this. Why do you think it works? Is it the explosive decompression that separates so much of the cytoplasm rapidly from the maybe membrane associated ribonuclease? What do you think? Yeah, we still have to further characterize the, what is really happening. But I think I think so. I, I guess that the nitrogen decompression helps somehow to 
to preserve the contents of the cytoplasm and also to maintain more or less the integrity of the membranes so that it can be fully separated from, from the cytoplasm. I, I cannot say that we don't have any fragments of membrane in, in the cytoplasm, in the lysage, because probably we have, but we have a concentration that's low enough to have expression that is visible as a measurable. Uh, so yeah, that's a good question. We are, we are still trying to find out exactly why this method works and why the others didn't work, so. But, but this really, I think mm -hmm. for the first time, so, so the, the goal of this project had been to create a mycoplasma cell-free extract that, you would, that we would somehow put in a, perhaps a synthetic membrane vesicle and then add a genome to it in, in, in some fashion and hope that you produced a living cell. And so we're we're now you know three years into the project where we never thought that making a cell-free extract would be hard. At least we can think about doing the experiment that we'd always wanted to do. Exactly. Anyone else? Yeah. Wilhelm, give that man a PhD. No, now I want to keep him a bit longer. Well, sure. <laughs> so he finally knows how to do it. So. <laughs> Chain him to so the lab. Terrific, it's a terrific breakthrough. Uh, so I never expected that the ribosomes would actually be functional. So so it's really nice to see that uh, we now have finally a, a active system. So as you say, John, uh, we can now start exploring to put it in a compartment and see how far we can uh, sort of create a ship in a bottle kind of thing. Uh, so 